series of seminars or webinars with the, at the Medical Physics of, for World Benefit. Um, our vision is a world with access to effective and safe application of physics uh, and technology in medicine. Uh, please join Medical Physics for World Benefit. Uh, and sorry, it has the auto transition, I guess. Um, it's M, uh, mpwb.org. Uh, today, our speakers, we have three of them Professor Thomas Kron, Dr. Renz Tino, and Professor Scott. <laughs> sorry, this happens. Uh, Scott Crow. Uh, from Australia. It's 11 uh, p.m. their time, so thank you very much uh, for joining us today at such a late time. Uh, Arjit, unfortunately, for family reasons, won't be able to join us today, but uh, I'll be moderating with the help of Yakov and Edward. Um, we'll start with Professor Thomas Kron. He'll talk about the needs, governance, and QA in 10 minutes, followed by Dr. Tino through the printing, A World of uh, Phantoms, for 25 minutes and then Scott will give us, or Dr. Scott will give us a uh, 25 minutes presentation also. Uh, then after that, we'll have the final comments and we'll thank you, we'll have our multiple choice questions and the webinar is, is recorded already or is recording right now as we speak and will be uploaded to um, the YouTube uh, website or channel rather. Our first speaker, Professor Thomas uh, Cron is the Director of Physical uh, Science at uh, Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia. His interests are in geosymmetry of ionizing rotation, image-guided radiotherapy, IGRT, clinical trials, and education of medical physics demonstrated by more than 230 papers in um, peer-reviewed journals. Over the years, he has maintained an interest in education reflected in 75 invited conference presentations, consultancies for the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, and involvement in workshops and training in Australia. Uh, this is very impressive. Welcome, uh, Dr. Crom. And uh, I truly look forward to hearing from you or to listening to your presentation. Dr. Rance uh, Tino, am I pronouncing your first name right? Rance? Rance? Rance is correct, okay. He has a bachelor's in biomedical engineering at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology <clears throat> in Australia. He continued the academic pathway at RMIT as a PhD candidate in 2018. His PhD research is in collaboration with the Peter McCallum Physical Sciences Department to develop low cost and customizable radiotherapy phantoms using 3D printing for treatment planning. Uh, recently, comparing his PhD, Renz is now working as a research assistant at Peter Max Physical Sciences Department to lead ongoing 3D printing projects, including a range of customizable phantoms for imaging and dosimetry applications. And I think we, I think we can see that you're still in your cubicle, and Dr. Cron mentioned that you're still at work. Um, it's impressive. Also, I really I truly look forward to hearing about making phantoms and the 3D printing of them. Uh, Professor Crow. Professor Crow is a medical physicist and researcher at the Royal uh, Brisbane and Women's Hospital with appointments at the University of Queensland and the Queensland University of Technology. He's the clinical lead of the cancer care program at the Hurston Biofabrication Institute where applications of 3D printing of biofabrication and radiation oncology medical imaging and radiobiology are being explored. I do look forward also uh, for the 25 minutes of uh, speech. Um, so please write any questions you have in the chat uh, window. I promise that I will read them. Uh, they will be brought forward to the speakers by us to be answered at the uh, questions and answers uh, session at the end. Um, before we start, I would just like to extend my thanks and the thanks of our, um, uh, uh, of everyone basically, including our WAPM and Medical Physics uh, World Phys um, for a world benefit, sorry, I'm just waking up. To Dr. Cron, Dr. Tino, um, Dr. Cron, welcome. And without further ado, we're ready now to uh, start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good day, uh, and good night, uh, wherever you really are. And, and the, the wonderful thing about medical physics for world benefits uh, is that it is really trying to, to have a global uh, reach. Uh, and uh, 
the topic we are covering today uh, is, is also really, I think, from global interest, because it is not linked uh, to particular uh, economic uh, circumstances and has really, hopefully, a very broad appeal uh, to, to physicists overall. I might share my screen uh, now and hope you can see that. Excellent. The Zoom tells me that the participants can now see my screen, which is exactly what I was hoping uh, would, would happen. I might leave it as, at, uh, as it is um, and uh, not go into presenter mode. I've maximized the, the uh, area here, uh, which is hopefully clearly visible. Uh, so we'd like to talk a bit about 3D printing and radiotherapy. And I'd like to kick off by talking a bit about governance and quality assurance. And I should also acknowledge Deepak Basaula, uh, who is uh, one of our clinical physicists, who is actually really overseeing our uh, 3D printing program in the clinic. Right, let's... Uh, see if we can go to the next slide. Uh, since I'm the first speaker, I just want to repeat the Wikipedia definition uh, of 3D printing or additive manufacturing. And I think the first take home message is that 3D printing and additive manufacturing is typically used synonymously. So it means the same, same thing. If we apply for grants, uh, then we typically say additive manufacturing. Uh, if we want to talk to patients and uh, talk to the general public, we talk about 3D printing, but it is more or less the same. And it basically works by building something from uh, scratch, uh, one layer typically at a time. It's quite different uh, to what we are used to, the subtractive manufacturing, where we take a big slab of something and then take off bits and pieces to uh, reveal the final uh, shape. Uh, 3D printing uh, is, however, not one thing. It, it is really a large variety of different uh, techniques uh, which can be used to build three-dimensional structures. It also comes with a vast range of different costs. And Rands will talk a bit more about many of these things. 3D printing has sometimes been called a disruptive uh, technology. And disruptive technologies we are used to in radiation oncology, uh, artificial intelligence is sort of the poster child for, uh, for uh, disruptive uh, technology. This is sort of one, uh, uh, just a paper. And we all would probably agree that this is disruptive. Disruptive in the sense not of disrupting sleep, being late at night, uh, or the breakfast being very early in, in the morning, but disrupting normal workflows changing things and being really not completely foreseeable in terms of its outcome. And we accept that very clearly in the context of artificial intelligence. The point we'd like to make is that this also applies at least in some respect to 3D printing, uh, where there are not a lot of governance and regulatory frameworks which are applicable. For example, are we allowed to print an object which is otherwise covered by copyright. Uh, can we print a 3D printer? Are all the materials good enough to be in contact with patient skin, potentially when it is uh, broken up by radiation uh, reactions? So there are probably also a number of issues with 3D printing, which we try to, to tease out a bit. Uh, I come from Peter McCann Cancer Center, uh, which operates on five campuses, and our 3D printing program uh, supplies four of these campuses. Uh, one of the campuses has its own 3D printing facilities. We are sort of a large-ish organization with 16 linear accelerators and do all sorts of uh, treatment uh, uh, techniques overall with about 7,000 uh, patients uh, treated per year. We have an interest in 3D printing since about four years, uh, and, and that was sort of fostered through a large research grant where we were part of a consortium uh, looking at training uh, of professionals in 3D printing. And, and that gave us sort of the opportunity to work with some university and academic groups uh, in Brisbane, where Scott is, 
uh, in uh, Wollongong and in, in Melbourne. Uh, and we do typically two things. We, we sort of print bits and bobs, equipment, parts, gadgets, phantoms, and, and QA devices. And we print things which are directly in contact with patients, bite blocks, bolus, brachytherapy applicators, and, and so on. And that's really how we structured this uh, lecture, uh, where Rance will talk a bit about uh, mostly phantoms, really, and then Scott talks more about the patient-associated devices. And I just want to quickly set the stage uh, by talking about our bolus uh, uh, program, uh, which is also operating since about 2013. It's a rather biggish fair, or it, it started small, uh, but it, it then grew very quickly, sort of reflecting how important and how needed this overall is. But it reflects also really the mechanical workshop uh, uh, we are working with at Peter Mac, uh, which has fantastic staff dedicated to all things mechanical and have spent quite a lot of time uh, to actually setting up a printing facility, which you can see, see here. Uh, we use uh, uh, PLA, FDM uh, uh, printing, and uh, when I looked last, we used about 120 kilos of material per year, and, and that's really just for patient uh, devices. 95% of these are for, for photons, 5% for, for, uh, for electrons uh, uh, overall. And most of it is really bolus, as you can see here on the, on the left is a breast, uh, bolus and that sort of a nose uh, uh, type uh, uh, bolus uh, here. A few comments. Uh, clearly, the orientation of the print matters it, uh, because uh, there are maybe some supporting structures. Uh, overall, in the time it takes depends very much if you print something upright or something lying down. Uh, a stable position or an optimized position is, is quite important. Nice is that we can embed patient IDs in the print, so mixing up things uh, are not uh, uh, not happening uh, in, anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, when large bolus is may be required uh, with print two parts. They actually clue together very, very nicely. How long does it take uh, to print uh, a bolus? Well, that depends obviously on the on the weight or the size of the bolus. And you can see here in this, this plot uh, that out of the 1400 boluses we've printed over the last three years, this is sort of the variation in, in weight, uh, somewhere sort of bulging around the 300 uh, gram uh, area being five millimeters thick, but going up to about two kilos of, of bolus. And the print hour time in hours is typically a couple of, of days. The workflow adds times, a time overall, but I must say having several printers uh, together uh, and having really excellent uh, staff uh, in, in the workshop uh, uh, makes that uh, much, much easier. Quality assurance is something uh, which is also probably quite important, and you can see here some of the earlier boluses, uh, which uh, were CT scanned, sort of we measure and verify the thickness in the CT scan, and we can see here, there, this is this, uh, an artifact from the CT uh, at, at, as such, but you can see that the homogeneity of the bolus is not necessarily something which is a, a printer given. Uh, there's some work to be done in terms of infill and, and so on. Uh, however, over the time, uh, our workshop really has developed a very smooth and high quality program. So we are not QAing all boluses anymore. Uh, and that makes sense uh, uh, because uh, having sort of about 500 boluses per year uh, to actually uh, uh, CT scan and judge really delays processes uh, unnecessarily. So what we do is once a month we print sort of a step wedge uh, uh, and uh, QA only the step wedge in terms of material composition, homogeneity, and particularly uh, in terms of the dimensions, are all the dimensions still uh, correct? We use obviously typical thicknesses, which we also would use in, in, in boulders. Uh, and by now uh, we have not 1400, uh, like the number of bolus, but about uh, 1200 uh, samples uh, uh, overall. They're all uh, within a, a fraction of a millimeter overall. Uh, 
The material also we use uh, metals and we've uh, experimented around with different PLA materials there. And you can see here the CT number depends on the uh, on the material, and that doesn't include here any. Uh, fluffing around with uh, uh, the infill uh, overall. And you can see also here that the standard deviation from one uh, 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 QA tool, uh, QA wedge to the next can be quite large, about 30 Hounsfield numbers, uh, plus minus 30 Hounsfield numbers, single standard deviation. Materials also matter because uh, toxicity could be an, an, an issue uh, uh, overall. So having uh, a fume hood uh, and extracting the fumes is important. Uh, uh, even PLA is probably not quite as, as, as toxic, but there are some rather toxic 3D printing uh, materials uh, uh, around. And then uh, there are medical grade uh, materials available, uh, which are certified for being able uh, to put in touch with patients. If you look at the variability of the, the material uh, in a bolus, uh, uh, if we don't consider the, the uh, material actually used, we may be out by one millimeter uh, between different materials and about 5% uh, 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 of boluses might be 5% out in terms of the uh, given density. Uh, uh, we're thinking just by the variability of the, of the prints. That takes me nearly to the end, uh, and I would like to, to particularly thank the Mechanical Workshop, uh, Barry, uh, Alan, Mark, and, and Peter, uh, who have uh, are doing an absolute fantastic uh, job. It is not a necessarily a straightforward process, at least not in our our process, and it does require quite a lot of, of work to get get things things right. Uh, in, uh, uh, it took us a couple of months uh, to actually get get there, but it is now absolutely part of uh, 3D uh, of patient care, uh, and uh, uh, we certainly wouldn't like to give that uh, away again. I'd like to finish off with two slides about regulations, uh, because after not being regulated for a long time in in, in Australia and most of the world, uh, regulators now have come. Uh, to, to the conclusion that obviously if a place like Peter Mack does 1400 boluses or 500 boluses per year, then this is an important and really absolutely essential aspect of our patient care. And that means there needs to be some guidelines, some processes in, in, in place which QA the materials, make sure that they're fit for purpose overall. And uh, the Australian government has put that into personal medical uh, devices. Lots of biomedical equipment is, is there. And so people don't miss it. They actually uh, put underneath the including 3D printing uh, printed devices overall. Uh, many jurisdictions have this either in draft form. If it is in draft form, it is a fantastic opportunity for medical physicists to actually get in touch with the regulatory authority and talk to them and explain what this is, is all uh, uh, what is this is all about. This is certainly something we are trying to to, to do and medical physicists. Uh, uh, are probably in the best position uh, of all to make this a success. So thank you very much. This is one of uh, Rance's handiwork uh, 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 as an award uh, we give uh, for, for Christmas, the uh, typical great Aussie barbecue award. And I would like to thank you for your attention uh, and I'm delighted to hand over to, to Rance, unless there are any immediate uh, uh, questions. I don't see any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cron. All right, I I'll shall I'll share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, this is Okay, all right. Yeah, first of all, I would like, I think I would like to thank uh, Thomas and the rest of the MPWB and AUPM board for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, yeah, today I'll be presenting an overview of radiotherapy phantoms and the 3D printing technology. The radiotherapy phantoms, as we know, uh, consist of tissue equivalent materials that are molded and casted as simple geometries, such as blocks and cones. Uh, to more sophisticated human-like 
anatomical geometries. Um, these materials emulate human tissues well in terms of their known photoelectric and Compton attenuations. There's, these phantoms are used for the acceptance testing, commissioning, QA and QC of new diagnostic and treatment machines. Uh, they use for routine uh, imaging endosymmetric tasks to ensure correct alignment and dose are implemented uh, in treatment planning to validate and verify personalized treatment plans for patients. And as we go further towards more uh, complex radiotherapy treatments, um, including the use of volumetric modulated art therapies, we certainly require phantoms that accurately represent the patient's anatomy and pathologies uh, to better understand dose distributions as well as to further optimize treatment plans. So now focusing on commercial anthropomorphic phantoms, uh, these phantoms represent the average proportion and tissue attenuation of a healthy living person. Uh, they're fabricated via a specialized molding and casting process uh, to mimic the geometry and densities of lung tissue, soft tissue, and bone. Uh, indeed, these phantoms consist of materials that mimics the same elemental composition and proportion by weight as human tissues, making them uh, highly reliable and durable. However, disadvantages include high manufacturing and material costs, um, limited customizability where some phantoms only allow the insertion of generic tumor shapes and sizes, uh, the unaccounted dose errors caused by the inaccurate representation of patient's proportion and pathologies. And then lastly, these commercial phantoms do not allow comprehensive end-to-end -end testing of complex treatment plans, uh, particularly for um, obese patients or for patients with tiny or cavitating lesions. Now, to address uh, these disadvantages, uh, why don't we use 3D printing? That's what Thomas has introduced. Uh, 3D printing is also known as additive manufacturing or AM, and is the manufacturing technology that adds input materials in a layer by layer or volumetric process. As an example below, um, the animation shows the, a commonly used 3D printing technology called material extrusion also known as fused deposition modeling, FDM, or fused filament fabrication, FF. And this is where melted thermoplastics or composites are extruded in a layer by layer fashion. So here, material extrusion 3D printing has a selection of affordable materials and machines, as well as having the capability to fabricate complex geometries, which, is, uh, which cannot be manufactured by your traditional molding and casting process. Uh, this wide selection of affordable uh, materials consist of physical densities that allows for emulating uh, tissue densities and can further emulate tissue heterogeneity via multi-material 3D printing processes. So before I start talking uh, more about 3D printed phantoms, I would like to walk you through a quick overview of the 3D printing history, uh, just to give you a clear understanding of how this technology evolved over the years. Um, for some of you, you might think that 3D printing is a new technology. Um, it certainly is not. Uh, Steel lithography or SLA, was the very first 3D printing technology that was introduced back in 1981 by Japanese inventor, Dr. Dare Kodama. Uh, the SLA process uh, utilizes UV light to cure or solidify photosensitive liquid into a 3D object, layer by layer. Uh, this was later passed on to Charles Hull, uh, where he successfully filed a, the SLA patent in, in 1986. Um, Charles Howell later founded one of the biggest 3D printing company today called 3D Systems. So in the 1990s, uh, we have the emergence of 3D printing manufacturers and uh, CAD tools. Uh, we have EOS, which specializes in metal and polymer printing with laser sintering technology. We have Z Corp, which was acquired by Charles Ha from MIT. Uh, which is now called uh, 3D Systems, which focuses on polymer and metal printing. We have Stratasys, uh, another well-known 3D printing company. Uh, they registered the trademark called FDM, with used deposition modeling, which focuses on polymer 3D printing. And alongside these companies, uh, we have CAD companies, uh, which have has emerged to aid 3D printing processes, which includes Autodesk, for AutoCAD softwares, and Dassault Systems for SolidWorks. So in the early 2000s, uh, we have the introduction of replicating rapid prototype of project or known, known as RepRap. Uh, this introduced the concept of parent-child 3D printing, uh, where the parent printer prints parts for the child's uh, child printer to function. Obviously, 
Uh, this is excluding the electro electronic components. Um, due to it being open source, which was a recipe for innovation, the project led to the development of affordable 3D printers, as we now know today. So in the 2010s, 3D printing has branched off um, to different applications. Uh, we 3D printed high strength and lightweight metals uh, for automotive and aerospace. Uh, circuit boards in the electronics industry, we have 3D printed chocolates and meat in the food. Uh, concrete houses in the civil construction industry. And last but not the least, we have the medical industry, uh, where they use 3D printing to develop the guides and tools uh, to aid surgical uh, procedures, anatomical models for education and training purposes, and bone implants. And now moving forward to 2020s, uh, here we have researchers putting emphasis towards smarter and multi-material and cooler uh, color 3D printing. Uh, we, here we can observe development of bio inks for bioprinting and which promotes efficient cell growth and functionality for tissue engineering applications. We have smart materials, for example, shape memory polymers that responds to change in temperature. We have the dual material printing using rigid and flexible material for pneumatic actuated devices. And lastly, we have the advanced multicolor printing systems. And this printing system enables fabrication of patient-specific anatomical models uh, with a selection of over 500,000 colors. So yeah, 3D printing is classified into seven main uh, technologies. And uh, we have material extrusion and bat photo photopolymerization. And these 3D printers are in the lower end of the spectrum and are widely used by entry-level users, hobbyists, students, and researchers. And the rest of the five technologies, we have SHT, DD, PBF, MJT, and VJT. Uh, they're in the higher end of the 3D printing spectrum, uh, which are mostly used for industrial and large-scale manufacturing of polymers, metals, and composite parts. So now going back to 3D printing phantoms, here's the commonly used workflow. Uh, the process initiates with the acquisition of diagnostic image um, commonly um, in the form of CT, and this is followed by a manual or automatic segmentation process of the cross-sectional CT data set. The 3D uh, models of the tissue segments are generated. Uh, popular software used for this process is 3D Slicer. Here we have the slicing process uh, that translates your generated 3D models to G-code. And G-code is a universal language for uh, these 3D printers uh, consisting of your X, Y, and Z movements. Um, this is also where you can implement your 3D printing parameters such as print speed, temperature into a pattern, and percentage. Lastly, we have the, the printing process. For material extrusion 3D printing, phantoms can be printed as shells, uh, which are filled with tissue substitute materials, or printed as solids, which are uh, printed with different 3D printing materials or infilling patterns or percentage. So now moving on, on to the emulation of tissue density in CT, uh, particularly on the use of mat material extrusion 3D printing. Here I'll briefly go through a few examples of 3D printing techniques to emulate lung, soft tissue, and bone densities. So in our early work, uh, we developed a patient specific thorax phantom slab that utilizes a single slice of the patient CT data set. So here we modulated uh, the various sizes of square voids uh, depending on the pixel value found from the CD slice. Um, here we make use of partial volume effect, um, and we were able to modulate the achieved HU range of the phantom slab, and as you can see in the mapped 3D contours of the CT image. So another method to emulate lung tissue density involves the use of jarred structures. Um, these are printed with ABS filament. Um, we have the known isotropic jarred structure. Uh, we, we found it to be uh, isotrop we found it to produce isotropic HU when scanned in different specimen orientations. And when controlling its periodicity and wall thickness, we can achieve HU values ranging from minus 850 to minus 180. And here's just a short video of uh, the 3D printed jarred structure uh, generated from micro CT. So on a more recently published work, uh, researchers uh, introduced pixel print um, this, and this method allows users to convert, directly convert DICOM slice data to G-code. And this allows you to take control of the printing speed uh, to produce patient-specific CT attenuations. 
of the 2D slice. For emulating soft tissues in bone, um, similar to the previous slide, uh, researchers modified the G code to modulate the filament extrusion width percentage um, when printing certain segments of an object. And this in turn can produce higher densities using the same filament. Uh, here researchers further utilize dual extrusion printing of PLA and PLA reinforced with concrete to fabricate a head phantom, which produce similar HR profile plots for bone and soft tissue compared to the patient CT slice data. Professor Crow and his research group uh, in Brisbane also demonstrated uh, the use of this uh, technology, dual extrusion printing, using the same uh, materials, PLA and PLA reinforced with concrete to emulate bone, muscle, and lung densities. Uh, infill percentage were lowered, uh, further lowered to reduce H2. Um, infill percentage defines the amount of material to, uh, that occupies the internal parts of the object. So another method to produce a wide range of bone-like densities is the use of interlaced deposition technique, uh, where we showed that interlacing layers of PLA and iron reinforced PLA together, uh, we can vary the, uh, we can emulate H values of bone marrow, cortical and cancerous bone densities in CT. So here's just a video, short video comparing a CT of the patient femur to the printed uh, femur bone phantom. So we don't need to necessarily use 3D printing for the whole fabrication process of the phantom. Uh, here researchers demonstrate uh, 3D printing of bone shells, uh, which were then filled with formulated amalgamate to uh, emulate densities of the ribs, uh, ventral and dorsal vertebral body for imaging and dosimetry work. Uh, another alternative method is to create your own filament. Um, this is via uh, mixing ABS pellets uh, with high dense bismuth pellets. Um, these are then extruded as filament for 3D printing. Uh, we also use dual extrusion printing of the ABS and we develop ABS bismuth filament to fabricate the head phantom. Uh, to quickly show you uh, how 3D printing can, can enable a customizability of phantoms, uh, here we demonstrate the insertion of a patient specific lesion in a 3D printed phantom slab, uh, which emulates soft tissue, bone and lung tissue, uh, tissue densities in CT. And we use these for end-to-end uh, -end testing of a VMAP plan for lung SEGA treatment. So from the recently published work last year, uh, we showed that we can 3D print a commercial phantom slab and customize it. Uh, so we segmented the lung section into sub-segments to allow for easy insertion and modification of patient-specific lesion models. For the soft tissue, we utilize the PLA material for bone, we used our interlaced deposition method of PLA and iron reinforced PLA. Uh, for lung tissue, we used these jarred structures with ABS. And for lesion itself, we used the ABS material as well. For imaging and dosimetry assessment, we used the patient specific speculated and cavitating lesion uh, into the selected lung sub segment. The whole 3D printed phantom slab was printed with a total printing time of 68 hours. Uh, with materials costing at around 37 US dollars. For the end-to-end -end testing, we developed a lung VMAP plan for the patient-specific lesion. We then measured the dose using manually cut dose film placed in between the lung subsegment containing the lesion. So after 18 hours since CT imaging, we scanned films and generated these uh, horizontal and vertical dose profiles. And here we can show the gamma passing rates of 99.8% um, compared uh, comparing planned and measured dose, doses fit within the clinical acceptable uh, ranges for lung, soft tissue, and bone. And yeah, this demonstrates a proof of concept um, on the clinical utility of 3D printed phantom slabs for end-to-end -end testing uh, personalized treatment plans. So in conclusion, um, yes, 3D printing is disruptively cool uh, due to the fact that uh, 3D printing presents researchers and clinicians affordable options. And this enables rapid iteration and customizability of phantom designs. Um, and due, to, due to its low cost manufacturing uh, and materials, uh, any radiotherapy centers can acquire one. Um, it's cool due to the fact that it can adapt point of care 3D printing, uh, meaning 3D printing facilities can be established within the radiotherapy centers for faster turnarounds, address local supply and demand, 
uh, enhance research collaboration between researchers, engineers, and clinicians for technological innovation and advancement. Uh, one of many examples I can think of is the Mayo Clinic's 3D printing lab, uh, which has produced more than uh, 6,000 anatomical models and has around 100 peer-reviewed uh, uh, publications in the areas of medical 3D printing since it was opened back in 2006. Uh, lastly, we have a very diverse 3D printing community uh, whom are willing to help. A notable group that some of you may know is the 3D printing special interest group of the RSNA, uh, where they have developed guidelines for 3D printing medical use in collaboration with the FDA. Despite this, um, 3D printing is not always sunshine and rainbows. Uh, inherent uncertainties from the 3D printing process, uh, and these uncertainties further vary by different manufacturers of 3D printers and materials. So it's true that radiotherapy centers can acquire new 3D printing, but requires a level of 3D printing expertise, proper quality assurance and control for 3D printing machines and materials uh, prior to conducting research and clinical work. Future work for 3D printing phantoms or in radiotherapy in general uh, requires a focus on developing 3D printing materials which accurately emulates elemental composition of real human tissues. And these can be termed as tissue equivalent or quasi equivalent materials. Um, and this certainly requires expertise in the areas of polymer science and 3D printing. Uh, research should also focus on forming consensus uh, on the 3D printing process for fabricating reliable and clinically functional phantoms uh, for radiotherapy applications. Here I highlight the importance of documenting all your 3D printing parameters uh, and processes uh, which are utilized to fabricate these radiotherapy devices. And I encourage more studies to build up the 3D printing database and explore other exciting applications in, uh, in radiotherapy involving proton therapy QA, uh, deformable image registration, adaptive dosimetry, nuclear medicine, and radiolics. Uh, by then, we can start working towards analyzing key 3D printing parameters, machines, and materials that are essential for specific radiotherapy applications, and will hopefully guide us towards uh, the proper development of standards and regulations. Uh, before I end the presentation, uh, I think I would like to acknowledge uh, Peter McGrove's foundation my supervisor, Professor Thomas Cron and Dr. Adam Neo, Biomedical Engineering and Mechanical Workshop Team at Peter Mac. Uh, my supervisors at RMIT Center for Additive Manufacturing, Professor Martin Leary, Professor Milan Brandt, and all the 3D printing technicians there. Um, lastly, I would like to thank uh, Professor Deet Mahutmaka at QUT, who is leading the ARC the Training Center in Additive Manufacturing, Biomanufacturing, uh, which has funded my recently conferred uh, PhD. Yeah, thank you all for your um, attention. Uh, and I hope my presentation emphasizes the significance and advantages of 3D printing and radiotherapy. Um, yeah, I've added my um, email here uh, for more detailed questions or questions you may ask in the future. Thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, I think Maker. Uh, it says in the slide where you talked about the ABS density, um, you said 1.1 gram per centimeter cube. But he says the Russian manufacturers filament try 1.04 gram per centimeter cube. So I guess there's like. Sorry, oh, it's one, it's, sorry it, I think that's a mistake. It should be 1.04. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry for that. Yes, 1.04. Yeah. Thank you, Rand. This was great. Thank um, you. We move now to Professor Crow. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, and, clear, uh, very clear. And the slides are there. Okay, so um, thank you for, for the invite uh, to, to speak about this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak about patient specific devices, so medical devices that are that are used for treatment, specifically of radiotherapy. Um, I wasn't sure if this was going to be a broader medical physics sort of presentation, but, but unfortunately I've really focused on um, radiation oncology here. Uh, so over the past few decades uh, that, that Rance has talked about, uh, 3D printing technology has become more and more affordable. And I think the barrier to entry has really continued to shrink. Um, and there's no better time basically than now to, to get involved with 3D printing. 
Uh, the ability to design patient-specific devices has resulted in an increase uh, of point-of-care manufacturing, so manufacturing devices within a healthcare setting uh, at the hospital. Uh, outside of medical physics, 3D printing is getting used for anatomical models, uh, for education, patient education and clinicians, uh, treatment simulation for things like surgical planning. Uh, it's being used for rehabilitation devices, so things like splints and, and tools that can help patients grip things, uh, implants and prostheses, uh, and that's getting quite complicated. It's looking at tissue engineering scaffolds and, and organoids. Uh, and then there's a lot of patient comfort and support devices, uh, things that are, are pretty similar to what's getting used in radiation oncology, uh, things like shells for burn patients, which are, are very similar to immobilization masks uh, in radiation oncology. Uh, so today I'm just going to discuss some applications of 3D printing technology uh, for medical devices in a radiotherapy setting. Um, share some experiences from my own department, which is the one shown here uh, in Brisbane. Uh, this is a department that has five linear accelerators, uh, two brachytherapy afterloaders and superficial radiotherapy. In addition to this treatment equipment, uh, we have a variety of what I'd call mid-range printers. Uh, and we also have access to some higher grade equipment as part of a research institute on our campus, the Hurston Biofabrication Institute. Uh, a couple of the physicists that work uh, at our department also have cheaper hobby level devices uh, that have also been used for for printing um, small pieces of equipment, usually QA devices. Uh, when I'm saying hobby level and mid range and high range um, in Australian dollars or probably US dollars too, we're talking three figures and four figures and five or more figures um, in terms of costs, so. Uh, Bolus was, was introduced pretty well by Thomas. Um, bolus or, or compensators uh, is used to shift uh, dose distributions, um, often to, to get an increase in skin dose. And it's perhaps the most common application of, of 3D printing that's being described in the literature and, and is certainly, you know, present in a lot of departments around the world. Uh, 3D printed bolus has numerous advantages. Uh, it can be prepared using patient images, uh, which means that you can potentially eliminate some um, physical molding processes that might exist in department that might use wax or, or plaster or, or thermoplastic um, on the patient. Uh, the design can be optimized within a treatment planning system um, so that you can basically design to improve the dosimetry of the treatment uh, using virtual bowl structures uh, within the planning system. Uh, as a fitted device, it can often match the patient really well. Uh, you can minimise the sort of air gap that might be there for maybe sheet bolus or jelly bolus, uh, which can reduce dosimetric uncertainties, uh, particularly for irregularly shaped fields. Um, so long skinny fields, for example. I mean, in some cases, personalised bolus um, really solves a problem that can't be solved very easily with, with conventional techniques like wax. Um, and I'll show a picture of one of those at the end of the presentation. Uh, I will just say the bolus doesn't need to be printed directly, even if you've got a 3D printer. Um, you're able to print parts, uh, print positives of the patient anatomy, for example, or a negative cast that could be filled with gel or silicon. Um, and some people have even looked at printing with low melting po point uh, materials, I've printed metal there, sorry, uh, low mel melting point materials that can maybe be modified uh, later by immersion in a, in a hot bath or something like that. Um, a few pictures are shown here, two from Thomas earlier, uh, and just a selection of, of boluses from, from my own department. Uh, another thing that's, that's possible is positioning devices. Um, various positioning devices and immobilization devices can be 3D printed. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be very patient specific. Um, so not necessarily just, you know, fitted to the anatomy, but it can solve some problems for patients that are presenting with maybe more unusual or less common um, cancers. So of the extremities of the hands and feet, for example, uh, shown here are quite a few things, um, a sort of template used to, to facilitate skin markups with a pen or to reproduce markups that a doctor has produced, uh, the holder there for fingers to keep them sort of splayed probably. Uh, bite blocks, which were mentioned by Thomas, and just what, basically face masks um, that can be used for, for immobilization. Um, 3D printing, I think, in some of these cases is a really great technology um, and can certainly be competitive with, with commercial solutions for these. 
Um, not all of the positioning devices that you can print do need to be matched or fitted to the patient. Um, it's often something that we focus on uh, printing to match an anatomy, um, but it can also just be printed to match a particular um, patient's sort of treatment regimen, um, a particular setup that you want the patient to be in. Uh, as an example, our departments have printed headrest spaces uh, featuring angles and thicknesses that are not commercially available. Uh, so that's better able to accommodate specific patients, but it isn't patient matched. Uh, potentially, it could be used for multiple patients. Um, so it's not all patient specific, let's say. Uh, our department's also looked at things like modular mouthpieces, uh, printing parts and having a stock of parts that they can then be put together uh, on a patient specific basis. Um, so not printed exactly for the patient anatomy, but printed with enough variation that you can make something specific to the patient. Uh, so shown there are uh, um, some tongue and cheek displaces that are able to move radiosensitive tissue away from, basically away from the beam to lower the dose. Uh, shielding is another option. Um, 3D printing has been used to create casts uh, that can be used to produce electron beam cutouts with low melting point alloys, um, or potentially using things like tungsten carbide mix, uh, which would be non-toxic, a non-toxic alternative. Um, so uh, potentially a way to, to replace some earlier mold room type uh, equipment uh, with 3D printing um, to get really good results. Uh, in addition to being used for bolus, you can print positives of patient anatomy uh, in order to maybe hammer out some lead sheeting uh, to, to best fit the patient um, for a superficial treatment, for example. Uh, and you can even do things like transfer skin markings um, to the printer. Uh, Thomas had the example before of, of printing the labels. Uh, you can do the same with skin markings. Uh, there are some high density 3D printable composite materials, uh, so tungsten composites, for example, that are suitable for shielding, uh, though they're not necessarily cost effective, uh, particularly if you compare it to, say, lead sheeting, which, which can be very cheap. Uh, brachytherapy is a, another fairly common uh, application of, of 3D printing. Uh, probably the most common application would be for superficial brachytherapy, uh, for surface moulds that conform to the patient topology uh, that, that's shown there. Also templates to, to guide needle insertion. Um, so there's a very patient specific sort of one there, but I've also seen examples like uh, for prostate and, and for, for templates that aren't necessarily going to be touching the patient in the way that that, that particular face um, template is. Uh, also patient specific gynecological applicators. Uh, obviously sometimes you'll get cases where a conventional off the shelf dome doesn't fit the patient very well uh, for whatever particular reason, potentially scarring, post hysterectomy, um, potentially the tumor itself. Uh, so a dome might give a poor dosimetric outcome in that the, the contact between the applicator and the mucosa is not really acceptable. Uh, you're able to 3D print uh, an applicator that, that sort of addresses that problem uh, with a lot of catheters, uh, channels for catheters uh, placed in it so you can achieve the dosimetric quality that you'd like. So that's just an example, I guess, of the sort of devices that you can print, the sort of medical devices that can be produced by a radiotherapy department um, that I think can improve outcomes for patients in a radiotherapy department. How do you go about printing these? Um, I'll first start off with the easy stuff, let's say. Uh, there's a lot of uh, free and open source software that allows the design of non-patient fitted or modular devices. So squares, circles, those simple sort of um, objects uh, can be combined or, or subtracted um, in order to get fairly complex shapes uh, using hard surface modeling tools. There's a lot of free ones out there, Tinkercad, Mesh Mixer, and Blender is probably the most complicated. Um, you're also able to design more complicated things, potentially things like catheter channels might be a little bit complicated to do with, with that sort of approach, particularly if they've got radiuses of curvature and, and things like that. Uh, so there is some software out there. Fusion 360 is probably the most popular parametric modeling tool, but it, it does come with a, a price. Uh, there are free alternatives, uh, open source alternatives, uh, such as OpenSCAD, um, where parts must fit together. I'll just 
warn you because that's something that you're often intending to achieve with with this sort of software you probably need to experiment with tolerances on the printed dimensions uh, just to be able to accommodate any variations between i guess your design and, and what gets printed um but you probably don't want to aim at tenths of a millimeter or or smaller than that in terms of a, of a tolerance um because otherwise you might need to then sand things down or, or do a lot of post-processing um, and it, it's not just, I guess, a limitation in things like extrusion width. There are also just uncertainties associated with printing, sometimes warping, for example, as the, the print cools down. Probably where the biggest advantage, though, is the preparation of patient fitted devices. So devices that specifically match uh, the anatomy of a patient. Um, and in order to be able to prepare devices, design devices uh, like that, you're going to need medical images uh, or, or other images of the patient, 3D models of the patient. Um, in a radiotherapy department, that's probably most commonly going to be simulation uh, CT images. Um, the potential to use diagnostic CT or, or MR data to maybe prepare devices prior to simulation. Uh, another thing that's that's available now and, and is certainly getting easier and easier to do, uh, mobile phones, smartphones often have functionality now for, for 3D scanning. Uh, and certainly there is free online software to do photogrammetry where you can take a few dozen photos of a patient from, from different angles and, and get a 3D model um, of, of their anatomy. Uh, once you've got some sort of 3D model of a patient, uh, you'll need to convert that uh, if it's not already in, in a format uh, that can be understood by conventional 3D modeling or, or software, 3D printing software, uh, you'll need to convert that to something like an STL. Um, so something that isn't necessarily a DICOM file, but in, instead a 3D model that can be edited. Um, that sort of export functionality is supported in a lot of treatment planning systems now, um, whether inherently or by addition of scripts um, that you can find online. Uh, it's also possible with open source software like 3D Slicer, which will allow you to import DICOM files and do your segmentation and do expansions and, and do subtractions and, and all of those sort of tools that you get in contouring software in treatment planning systems uh, in order to design a, a bolus, um, for example, for a, for a particular patient. Alternatively, you can do that sort of uh, work in 3D modeling software. Uh, so software like Mesh Mixer, for example, will allow you to expand and add and subtract volumes, uh, smooth and simplify uh, a 3D printable design uh, and add labels, add text, for example, as, as Thomas uh, discussed. Uh, here, I just go very quickly through how you can use a 3D scan um, to design a bolus. Uh, this is a process that would take about 30 seconds. Uh, I've chosen this as an example because I expect that, that many of you are probably familiar with uh, creating contours and volumes within a treatment planning system, um, being able to make a virtual bolus and then exporting that. Uh, in this case, in about 30 seconds, with some very rough drawing, you can, I guess, highlight a an area uh, where you'd want to bolus uh, and separate that, do an extrusion and get, in this case, a, a 10 mil thick, uniform thickness uh, bolus. Um, you could then go and potentially do things like add catheter channels to that in order to um, have it be a brachytherapy, um, superficial brachytherapy mold. So once you've got a design, um, you, you'll need to print it. Uh, once a device design is accepted, um, so usually in a, in a department, you're going to have some sort of process for acceptance of, of designs prior to printing. Um, you need to convert it to instructions that a 3D printer can understand, which requires slicing of the design into the layers that get deposited sequentially. Uh, for some devices, uh, you'll want to optimize the orientation of the print on the print bed. Um, maybe to ensure, for example, that scaffolding that's required to support the devices that's being printed is not located on the patient face inside of the device so that when it's removed, it doesn't need too much smoothing to be able to be placed on the patient. The material will vary depending on design requirement. You might want some flexibility, so something like a TPU. Uh, you might want it to be able to withstand temperature sterilization, um, in which case you might want a resin. Um, you might need to do some specific post-processing to be biocompatible uh, with resins, for example. 
Uh, many plastics are close to water equivalent, which is frequently something you want with a, an applicator or, or with bolus. Um, and as discussed, you can fine tune that density with selection of infill patterns and infill density. Uh, some materials do require a larger nozzle diameter, uh, which can also reduce print times to increased layer heights, uh, though at the cost of a sort of less smooth finish, a little bit less precision. Um, and as mentioned, there needs to be some post-processing, which will probably mean removal of scaffolding, uh, maybe some smoothing of the device, cleaning of it, potentially sterilization, uh, packaging and, and marking up um, for placement on the patient. Uh, Thomas discussed quality management um, at the, the Peter Mac. I'll just give an example here of, of how we've approached it for medical devices that are, are used for treatment. Uh, we have a process that's, that's captured in our um, oncology information system in Mosaic, uh, that's sort of an assessment. And at each step in the production of the device, someone basically signs off that that step has been done. Uh, so preparation of the STL and the design, uh, that the print has been started and it's been post-processed and it's been QA'd. Uh, the QA is shown here. Um, in our case, we're a less mature program than, than the Peter Mac. Uh, so currently we're um, scanning all of ours, uh, though that's probably not something you need to do if you've got a mature program, particularly if you're using the same materials consistently and the same printers. Um, in our case, we're looking at, at the radiological density uh, and also the geometric match between uh, the design and what ends up getting printed uh, with house off distances. So a couple of recommendations, uh, almost at the end. Um, providing 3D printed devices does not need to be expensive. Uh, some of our printers are high grade, uh, they have multiple nozzles and they've got some uh, ease of use sort of um, features like if it runs out of filament, it will automatically pause um, and you won't have wasted that time. But I would say that basically most of the objects that have been shown here can be printed on a, on a fairly cheap entry level printer. Uh, I would say if you do want to print a flexible material, uh, do look at a direct drive solution uh, and that is that the the gear that sort of extrudes the filament or pulls the thrill, filament through the print head is as close as possible to the to the nozzle uh, through which the the filament is extruded uh, the software described in this presentation i think is, is fairly easy to use uh, there is a lot of information online there are plenty of youtube videos uh, almost any question i think that you could ask uh, has been asked before um, and you'll be able to find your answer online uh, I would say there's a cohort of patients that benefit from 3D printing um, that maybe were difficult to treat with conventional techniques. Uh, the example that I mentioned earlier in this presentation was a patient that was missing part of their nose uh, and forming a, a wax bolus here um, would be really difficult. Forming any sort of bolus on the patient themselves would be very difficult uh, and making a plaster cast would be difficult just because uh, there'd, there'd be that risk of, of uh, an object maybe falling into, into that cavity, um, particularly an object that, that might not, you know, have mechanical integrity. Uh, as mentioned before, prints sometimes fail. Uh, I would say clinically you should have timelines to establish, establish to allow the, um, I guess, other attempts to be made if QA does fail. Um, before the patient starts. And without those contingencies, you might need to fall back on conventional techniques like, like wax. Um, shown here are a couple of examples of failure. In one case, there's a little bit over a two mil warp at uh, the corner of uh, an object, but the thickness was fairly consistent. So the dosimetric impact of that, probably quite small. Um, in the next one, the printer stopped extruding near the end of the print. Um, and so there was just a, a centimeter or two of material that wasn't there. Um, and for the first fraction before we reprinted this, we just added like a, a wax block to, to fix that issue. Um, sometimes you can't fix the issue. Um, and shown here is a, I guess what we call a, a bird's nest, um, just a, a very large failure um, and a waste of a lot of filament. So in conclusion, I think 3D printing allows the production of, of bespoke personalized devices um, that often have advantages over uh, current existing alternatives. Um, there are risks associated with 3D printed medical devices. Um, you should have a, some sort of quality management system in place. Um, for a lot of applications, I would say that those risks are easily managed um, un unless it's getting maybe put inside of a patient um, or there's exposure to fluids, for example, I, I think it's, it's very easy to achieve um, 
what is required of a, of a 3D printed device for, for clinical use. And I would say uh, that the purchase of a 3D printer to prepare these sort of clinical devices also allows the production of the phantoms and jigs that, that Rance talked about. Uh, and when you look at the potential costs of those items, I, I would say that a 3D printer represents a very good investment um, that you'll very quickly get a return on that investment. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a few questions. Um, Muzammar Zahid, he's wondering if 3D printing brachy mold for patients, um, if they need to be registered to medical device authorities or not. I don't know if that depends on the country or, or not, because um, Mecca answered regarding Russia. He said the Russian Federation, um, they require certification of the material, but not necessarily the product if it's going to be inserted in a patient or used for patient, but if uh, it's not implanted, then it does not need any certification. But well, I guess that varies, right, between a country and another, probably. Okay, Stephen Hope uh, says- uh, so I, can also, I, I can also com comment on that. In Australia, we are in a, a transition period. At this point in time, we had to notify our regulatory authority that we intend uh, to to do that in, in in the future, but in I think it's 2024 uh, that uh, this there is a more stringent process in place. That what that actually looks like exactly we don't know yet. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Khan. So can you cons uh, from Stephen Hill, um Can you consider in vivo measurements as an alternative QA to scanning every bolus? I'm not sure uh, how that works. It's even so, more work. Sorry? It will not It's even right? more work. It is not even more work. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but in, in principle, yes. Uh, but uh, it, it depends really what your clinical practice is. If you have a well uh, uh, used diet or MOSFET system, uh, then that that obviously would would be an, an option. What it doesn't capture is is really the inhomogeneity in in the in some of our earliest earlier earlier boluses. Uh, we had variations in den density uh, across the bolus, and that that means that you measure at the center and it all it all looks good, but as you go out, you you uh, you are not. Correct. Also, the interpretation in, in photon, for example, for head and neck cancers, where we use bolus for IMRT uh, treatments or VMATs, uh, the, the positioning of the, uh, of the in vivo dosimeter would be a, a pretty challenging. And then the interpretation that this is verifying the bolus. But I, I, I think it's, it's worth in some circumstances to do. Thank you, thank you. David Willis, um, how is information about patient-specific devices used during treatment recorded in their medical records? For example, is the G-code retained? Do you store surf scans if used in the design process? I, I, I don't want to talk all the time. Uh, I, I think the others know much more about, about 3D uh, uh, printing, but certainly for, for bolus, the, the documentation comes from the treatment planning system. Uh, the, the bolus, we, we design our bolus in the treatment planning system, and as such, it is documented there. I, I would say that, yes, we've also been, I guess, contouring virtual bolus generally, um, and so that will be attached to the treatment plan. Um, and the, the patient record in the oncology information system would also, in our case, record, I guess, the QA that had been performed and um, the approval of that bolus structure and, and all of those steps. Yeah, and the setup notes in also will, will then uh, document where the, the bolus goes or any, any of these devices. Great, thank you. Um, Ryan Brown. His, uh, he says, from a regulatory perspective, for example, TGA for medical devices, for higher risk patient prints, such as internal gynecological insertion of a 3D printed applicator, how have you gone about obtaining approval of the internal device? 
is it different to obtaining approval for an internal sub, uh, substitute process using the classical mold, uh, molding process? And are there any barriers such as a uh, price to obtaining approval? Sorry, kids going to school. <laughs> I, I don't know what the TGA uh, uh, view is, and, and we haven't used any any high risk uh, uh, devices. We've done brachytherapy uh, and, and as such. Uh, I, I think the Australian uh, regulator uh, takes the view if you use a, a device uh, which is approved, so basically not a, a home-built 3D printer, I think you would have problems. And, uh, in, in, and, and we would, in these cases, use uh, medical grade uh, PLA, which, which is about twice the cost uh, of the, of the uh, normal PLA. But we don't do, do that for bolus because of cost reasons. Okay. Uh, David says, can 3D printers support in making individualized compensators for proton and proton therapy? I think that's what we use it for, right? For as compensators, for photons at least. I don't know about proton therapy. Yeah, you can do that. It's been done. Yeah, it's been done, yeah. Uh, but someone commented, uh, Maker um, commented for David, comment for David, recycled waste from 3D printing has worse properties than the original material and is of lower quality. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, um, and mainly um, those recycled materials, they're all mainly used for uh, rapid prototyping, uh, just for testing geometries. Um, and, but yeah. Uh, 3D printing parameters for recycled materials, they vary differently to the ones that it's, uh, uh, it's original or raw, it's filaments. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions if you guys have time. Um, you talked about how it's cost effective to uh, start 3D printing, especially at this time. Um, but you also talked about Toxicity. Does that mean that you have to build a whole lab with a fume head and dedicated um, area for it? And if so, then how how costly could it go? You know what I'm saying? Or could it be? Uh, so I I could speak maybe for in our research institute they're printing all sorts of, of materials uh and so there they've done a lot of due diligence and um measured quantities of uh you know aerosols and, and things that might have been put out by by the printer to make sure it's a safe level uh some things like abs i guess it's well known that that some of those chemicals can be nasty um for pla i would assume a lot of places probably accept um maybe any risk that might exist uh I, I think so long as if you have access to things like extractors putting your printers under them is probably a a pretty good idea um but i'm sure that lots of people are not i see thank you thank you we, uh -huh. we, we use an extractor but but uh our facility is in in the in the basement uh so there isn't uh it it helps the airflow in, 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 in general and it's aerosols. And, and very quickly, when, when, you, when you use this PLA, you, you may want to use then other materials uh, and I, I think future proofing and having a good ventilated workplace and an extractor is, is probably a good idea. Because to, to retrofit, it, it's always more expensive. And if you set up the facility and you are in a, in most hospitals, there are uh, 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 provisions uh, to to have extractors, air yeah, extractors. Thank you. Um, is there any QA? You might have spoken about this already, though, uh, for three D printers for the printer itself. 
do we need to QA that too as medical physicists or not really? Or do you just QA the products that come out and that should be fine? Uh, I, th I think uh, mainly, um, yeah, I mean, for clinical bolus work, uh, machines will need to be QA'd and control, um, quality control as well. And this is mainly implemented by, in, in our research institute, it's implemented by the mechanical workshop team. Um, and they have generally developed a QA system for those machines. Every time we buy a new machine, they go, go through a QA for two, three weeks. Um, mainly uh, just to make sure that printed filaments produce this, uh, the expected densities we, we get in, in the imaging and the symmetry. Yeah, I, I, I think, as, as Lance has pointed out, in, in, uh, we, we probably would call that more commissioning, and, and that is really absolutely essential. But, but then QA is, is also important. If, if the temperature isn't right, then uh, you know, the print that doesn't work, but the commissioning is something which which is is really cannot be overstated. That that really needs 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 to be done. I see. Thank you. Um, last question: um, If every radiotherapy center acquired one, do, would that put the CIRS and other companies out of business, or not necessarily? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think 3D printing manufacturers will always be there, I reckon. Um, I mean, in terms of developing, mainly developing specialized materials, uh, we definitely need those manufacturers. Um, um, but yeah, if we all radiotherapy centers get their own 3D printed, that'd be great. Um, I mean, that just um, addresses some of the some of the problems, I mean, in terms of 3D printing jigs and fixtures, um, not just medical physics department, but also biomedical engineering department. Um, yeah, it would be very useful. I, I would just say that one of the things that we very frequently print is not necessarily a full, let's say head phantom, um, but we might print an insert for a SERS head phantom. Um, so we, I guess augment or supplement, you know, our, our commercial phantoms with 3D printed um, pieces. Uh, and I, I think that that's a really nice solution. I, I don't know what SIRS and, and those other companies might might think of it, but um, yeah, it's very useful as a department. I, I, I think this, Scott is perfectly right. I think this is about complementing e each other rather than, than competing. Nice, thank you. Well, um, unless there are more questions, I think um, it's time to uh, conclude the session. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the attendees and the participants. Uh, lots of thanks to Professor Cron, Dr. Tina, and Professor Crow um, for joining us, especially at a late time, as uh, we stated. Um, thanks to the APM headquarters and uh, uh, board of the MPWB. Um, special thanks to Farhana Khan, of course, facilitate um, the sessions. And um, please join uh, the MP, the Medical Physics for All Benefits, basically. And uh, we we'll look forward to uh, seeing you next time, next webinar. Edward, you have a word? Uh, yeah. Are we good? Yeah, thank you very much for everybody and uh, keep tuned for, for more webinars to come. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night, uh, everyone. Thanks again. This was great, thank actually. You. I learned a lot today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks night. so much, everyone. Thank you so much.